John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're not, and then, and then uh, in just a moment, I'm going to go through John, or go over to Matthew 21, but we're going to start in John chapter 1. John chapter 4. This is the fifth and almost the last part of the series. Next week will be the final part of the series. And this morning, John chapter 1, verse 4 says this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And I want to put that in the present tense, tense for us because I want to say as the title of the message this morning, in him is life. In him right now is life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for our choir. We thank you for our worship. We thank you, God, for the worship team. We thank you, God, for everybody that walks with you and worships you. We thank you, Lord, that your presence is here. And so, Lord, I just ask God today, may your name be glorified in this message this morning. Lord, that as we as we close out, Lord, it, coming to the end of this series, and Palm Sunday is today that we worship you. Lord, we thank you so much for what you did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. Help us to remember that in you is life. Only you is life. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that this morning as we, we, we look at the Word of God today, I pray that you would open it up to us, that we may see what's going on, and we understand the passage and what's happening in, the, in Scripture at this day. And, Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In Him is life. Now, if you flip over in your Bibles to the... Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21. The Bible says in verse 8, And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road. Verse 9 then says, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Then the Bible says in verse 10, And when he had come into Jerusalem, when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Now one more verse of Scripture before we get go forward. Psalm 118 says this, Save now, I pray, O Lord, O oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Now, putting these together, we see this the message of Palm Sunday. We find that the final week of Jesus' ministry here on this world takes place of what we commonly call Palm Sunday. It's the week that... Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a, a donkey. And so we see that as he comes into this, into the atmosphere and the, into the atmosphere of, 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 of this city that's bustling about about Passover, we find that there's some, there's some hidden meaning here in this text that I believe we gloss over and we, we forget when we don't understand what's going on. Have you ever had the idea, have you read this, some of you have been around in the church, how is it that you can put your clothes down on the road and put the palm branches down on the road on Sunday and cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and then by Thursday ready to kill you? Friday morning yelling, crucify. I mean, that is crazy. You know, that, that is to think that somebody could go from loved. I mean, I can understand over a period of time you could go from love to hated. I mean, we see it in our modern political system. I mean, we went to, if you look over, if you remember back in 2001 when the, the September 11th hit and we had the terrorist tax, I, uh, attacks, we had the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the presidential approval, I think it was in the 90% range or something like that. And by the time George Bush left office, it was like 20 or 30%. And, but that was over about eight years. You know what I mean? That was over a period of time. This was a week. You know, he went, Jesus went from 
the greatest person ever, or so we think that's what the Bible's telling us, to the moment that they're ready to kill him. And so what is going on in this text and how does it apply to life and how can it bless, how can I understand what, why this take, took place and go through it? And if you look at your Bible and look at Matthew 21, you see as this what we call the triumphal entry, this moment where he comes in in Matthew 21. He rides in on the donkey. He comes into this place. And they say the word in verse, in chapter 21, in verse 9, chapter 21, verse 9, they say, they say, then the multitudes who went before and those who followed out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna. Now, by this time in Christian tradition, by this time in Christian environment, Hosanna to the son of David means praise to the Lord. That's what it means for us. If you stand up here and you sing, we used to sing the little kids' songs, Hosanna, Hosanna, praise the Lord. You know, you had little kids walking around with palm branches, Hosanna, Hosanna. That means praise the Lord to us today. But what really Hosanna meant back in those days was what Psalm 120, 120, 118 says, Save now, I pray. Save now. Save now. So what it means for us and what we understand in Psalm 118, 25, when you put it in the context of what, what he's saying here, the people along the road are putting down the palm branches of, 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 of the time of Passover, and they're putting down their clothes down around their robes as Jesus comes in because what they are asking Jesus to do is to deliver them from Roman occupation. They are telling Jesus, save us from Rome. You're with me. Save us from Rome. Hosanna to the son of David. They gave him the title of the king. And they said, we're going to follow you, David. We're going to follow you, Jesus, as David. Save us from the king. We heard just a few moments ago, we heard about Lazarus, how you raised him from the dead and how he was was gone. And then you brought him back. We've heard about your miracles. We've heard about your testimony. We've heard about all these things that you've done. And so now you come in fulfilling salvation. Zechariah's prophecy and you are riding in on this donkey and so we are welcoming you into the Jerusalem and we are saying deliver us Jesus save us Jesus and then we cry out in Psalm 118 26 blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord that's what they're doing that's what they're saying that's what they're meaning when this happens they are not worshiping Jesus as we sometimes put that on that text they are telling Jesus All right, our king has finally come in. You see, what you don't understand is is prophetically to the day, this is the moment that that Daniel had prophesied that Jesus would go into the city, that the Messiah would go into the city. And those that were in the knowledge and understanding what biblical prophecy that, uh, that Daniel had prophesied several hundred years earlier and had, it was coming to pass that day. That mixed with Zechariah's prophecy, they saw it happening right in front of their eyes. Could you imagine if we would see prophecy happen right in front of our eyes, what we would do? We would, we would just worship God. We'd be excited. Oh, wait, that is happening. And we can't get people to get into church. It is happening all the way around this, and people are skeptical of it, even though it's been prophesied for 2,000 years, what's going on? And it's happening in our very day, and people are still skeptical over what's happening. And yet we see today, this is what happened. About 500 plus 600 years had been taking place since Daniel had prophesied what was going to take place, and now they were seeing it in their own day, and they were skeptical and so they misunderstood what they were saying, and they misunderstood what was happening, and they, they wanted Jesus to deliver them. So what has just taken place, because this is Passover, if you could go in your mind to Jerusalem, Jesus comes in from the east, and so as he comes in from the donk, on, riding on this donkey, what is going on is he's showing, the, showing Jerusalem how humble he is. He's not on a white horse, he's on a donkey. He's showing the humility of where he's at as king, and they recognize that prophetically. But what has just taken place 
What has just happened that we don't see in Scripture but that we know because it's Passover is that the lamb that has come through by the priestly procession and they have come through from the east and they have taken that lamb and they have taken it to the temple and they have taken it to the temple and they are setting it on the temple for the first four days before they sacrifice the lamb so that they can inspect it to make certain that it is with a lamb without spot or blemish that they could sacrifice for Passover. And so immediately following that march, Jesus rides in. You with me? So immediately following that march, Jesus rides in. We know that he is our Passover lamb. We know that he is the one that, 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 that was sacrificed for our sin. But watch where Jesus goes. Let's just look at the headings of Scripture if you've got a Bible that does that. You see immediately Jesus goes in chapter 21. He goes to the temple. That's where the lamb had just went in. He goes to the temple. What does he do there? He goes in there and he's pretty mad because it's it, he, he cleanses it and he says my house should be called a house of prayer he goes into it what is he doing he's inspecting the place and he's finding it with spot and blemish and so he's he's destroying the area he's throwing over the tables and he's he's whipping them and, and chastising them and so they were they were upset they were irritated at him at what he had done but then he just to prove that he really is king, that he really deserves it, he then turns in verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. I wish we could get back to the place where if you come to the house of God, you can get healed. And I don't mean just physical healing, I'm talking about everything. When you come into the house of God, you should be healed emotionally. You should be healed spiritually because there's no better place to be than the arms of Jesus. There's no better place to be than the house of God where Jesus is ministering and moving and around us today. And so he brought them in. And the, the chief priests in verse 15, when the scribes saw all the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple saying, Hosanna to the son of David, remember, save us. Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these kids are saying? You know why? Because that means Rome is going to come and wipe us out. You follow me? Do you hear what these children are saying, Jesus? You better be it. You better be it. Because if you're not, and if you're not it, we're going to be in trouble because Rome is going to come in and Rome is going to wipe us out and Rome is going to destroy us and Rome is going to come into this place and we will not even have the freedom to do what we're doing. And then Jesus turns and you can see, you could talk about praise. Jesus turns and he, the fig tree is withered. He, he prophesies over that, speaking about the withering of the nation because they're in the process of rejecting their king. And then he goes on, and they come to him in verse 20, verse 23, and he walks into the temple, and they're ready to test him. By what authority are you trying to claim as king, Jesus? By what authority are you trying to say that you are king? And they go after him, and he's, he, get, he answers them, and you can read that, and he tells them the parable of the two sons, and he tells them the parable of the vine dressers, and then he tells them the parable of the wedding feast. And then they think, okay, we got to get this guy because he is leading the people away from Rome. He's leading the people, and if he's really not the Messiah, we're going to be in trouble. So what they do, they ask him in chapter 22. They say, teacher, verse 16, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. We're speaking to him as a king and saying, you don't care about these people because what you're doing is you're setting them up to be destroyed. But you're speaking the truth. You following with me? I hope I'm painting a story for you that maybe you've never seen before. And so as he looks at this, as he goes through, he says, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? How coincidental is it that we got to pay taxes to Caesar here in about two days? Oh, taking the pound of flesh here coming up. So Jesus says, why do you test me, you hypocrites? 
show me the tax mark. And they brought him the coin. They brought him a denarius. And he says, whose inscription is that? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, then give to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. And so he, he stumps them. And then the Sadducees, okay, they're, they're pretty upset because they don't believe in a resurrection. They walk around and so they come against Jesus and they test him about the resurrection. The scribes come in and they want to know by what authority are you teaching. And they ask him about the, the what's the best commandment. And so they're trying to base their decision. Are we going to follow this guy or what are we going to do? And then, and then Jesus turns on them and says, these scribes, he gives them an answer that stumps them again. And then Jesus begins to speak woe over them in chapter 23 of the scribes and the Pharisees. Pharisees. And then finally, we see in the, chapter 23, verse 37, as he gets to the end of all this trouble, he gets to the end of all this testing because they're trying to see, is this really the Messiah? And they recognize that they are not, and that they, they are thinking that he is not. Jesus says this. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Verse 38, see, your house is left desolate, for I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You follow me the story now. And now they're ready to kill him because he has basically took them down. He took them out and he had, they, they thought this guy, this guy is going to cause Rome and we're going to lose our power and we're going to lose our authority. We're going to lose everything if people follow him. And so they decided that they were just trying to figure out how can they kill Jesus. And so Jesus takes his, his disciples away, and then now we see in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 about, about what the signs of the end of time it's going to be. And now we find that they are ready to betray him, and now it's Thursday, and now they're ready, they're, they're ready to celebrate the Passover. They're ready to do the things that they're, they're, do, they're, they're going on, and they work through this process of betraying the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we know that Jerusalem missed their day of visitation. Jerusalem missed their day of visitation. Jesus came in and fulfilled prophecy. Jesus came in to offer them life. But because he did not fit into their box, he, they rejected him. And I'm telling you today that Jesus rides into our presence asking us to deny ourselves and come follow him. He's asking us to walk with him. But because sometimes we don't like what he's doing or we don't like the, uh, the place that we are, we want to keep our sin. We want to keep what we're in we reject him because it requires us to sacrifice everything it requires us to give up our comfort zone it requires us to give of ourselves and it's not just simply that he's going to come in and make my life just peachy he's not going to just come in and make everything go well it means that I'm going to follow Jesus and I'm going to surrender everything at the cross and I'm going to live a life that is an abundant life that is a wonderful life that is a new life that is a true life I'm going to live a life that I could never in a million years imagine what that life would be like but yet I still have to surrender at the cross I still have to surrender at the cross and many times we do not have life because we don't understand this powerful phrase in him is life you got to release it Jerusalem missed their moment they missed their moment they missed their time Jesus came in and they missed him we could see it today that we, we have worship services, we have time together, we have place together, we have atmosphere where God is moving in our midst. And many times you'll walk out and you'll have people that will smile at me and just, just say, good to see you, Pastor. And then, you'll have, then I'll see people that they, I know that I know that I know that God did something in their life. And how is it that we can both be in the same service how is it that we can both be in the same service and one person has a dramatic, life-changing encounter with Christ and another person leaves as cold and as dead as they were when they came in? 
Why? Because one person was willing to say, Jesus, without you, I'm nothing. Jesus, without you, I can't make it. Jesus, without you, there's no hope for me. Jesus, without you, there's no way. And whatever you want to do, Jesus, whatever you want to say, wherever you want to go, Jesus, that's what I want to do. And the other person says, I'm still mad at sister so-and-so, and I'm still irritated at brother so-and-so, and I'm still got an issue there, and I still have issues in my spirit, and I, I don't like my, my, something happened to me 30 years years ago at a church that an old lady in a church said to me, said something about my dress and I didn't like that and now I blame Jesus ever since then. And you think that's crazy? That stuff that pastors hear all the time. Somebody changed the color of the carpet in my church and I ain't going back. You following me here? I mean, we, we allow anything to get us distracted. We allow anything. And I'm telling you, it's a perpetual Palm Sunday, meaning every day Jesus rides in. Every day he's willing to meet with you. And your day of visitation today, because today's the day of salvation. Every day you can have life. Every day if you just reach out to him, you can receive this beautiful, wonderful life. If you will just surrender all, every day you can have it if you just reach out to Jesus. So we have to recognize that we have to surrender. But if you surrender, let me tell you what you receive. 1 John chapter 3 says this. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. We know that we have passed from death to life because there are sometimes. There are issues in this world that it prevents us from loving one another. And we know that we are able to love one another and we're able to walk with God. We're able to love one another because we are walking with God. Because we are living with God. We have passed from death to life. We, are, we have got a new life in us. And listen, it is, it, there are times where it doesn't work well. There are times where we all think, what is going on, God? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? And the only hope I can give you today, and the only thing I can give you is in the personality of Jesus and the personality of God, that God is good and God is faithful and he will not forget you. He will not never forget leave you or forsake you he will never forget you i'm telling you the truth that today though those that are still out there they don't understand why they can't receive the life they don't understand why they can't pass from death to life and the answer is simple the answer is real and the answer is that you've got to surrender all at the foot of the cross and it's not about you it's about jesus and it's not about your plan it's about his plan and if you get into that you're going to flow in a life that is going to be so dramatic that is going to be so fantastic that you're going to be and do and become the thing that God has called you to be amen anybody that goes down the river knows there are times that the river the flow of the river is easy and there are times that the flow of the river is a little choppy but it's still the same river the same direction and what we sometimes do is we get mad at God and the water is choppy. And because the water is choppy, we, we turn our boat around. What's the one of the last things you want to do when the water's choppy? Turn your boat around. Because what happens when you turn your boat around? You're probably going to sink and die. At least I would because I can't swim. Let's not talk about that. So when we have baptism coming up, y'all pray for me, all right? My wife's scared of spiders. I just revealed my phobia. We don't need to talk about it. But when you turn that boat, you are just paddling and paddling and paddling and paddling. You're not going anywhere, friend. You're going against the current. And because you are going against the current, and then we, we, we get, how crazy would it be to say, man, this current is mean. I tell you what, this current never gives me what I want. I'd, I'd like to be back on that 
that other current. That was the still water part where it was easy to go whatever way I wanted to go and do whatever. I, I want to get back to that current because that current's good. I want to be back there and we're just trying to go back and back and back and back. And you're not getting anywhere. Why? Because God says if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to follow me where I'm taking you. And sometimes it's choppy. But let's, let, let me understand something here. It's not always going to be choppy. And it's not always going to be this way. But it's always the best way. Because if you turn and go against it, surely you shall die. But if you will turn and go with it, your God who loves you and cares for you and wants the best for you in your life. And I'm going to show you in Scripture that that is a truth. That God is going to take you to places and be your shepherd to lead you beside those still waters but he knows sometimes you got to go through the choppiness of life but I will see to it that you come out on the other side praise God and this life is true the Bible says in Luke chapter 12 then one came from the crowd saying teacher tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me but he said to him man who made me a judge over an arbitrate or an arbitrator over you Sounds like a guy from the 70s there. Man. Just saw that. And he says to him, Take heed and, and be aware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. See, the true life of God, when I'm talking about blessing, I don't mean that you've got the, the best of the possessions. I mean, you've got, what I'm saying is you've got the best of Jesus. That whatever you have need of, he's there. And that sometimes you are blessed and highly favored and all you've got is two pennies to rub together. But you know that somehow God's going to put bread in that cupboard and somehow God's going to provide meat and somehow God's going to take care of you because he's done it. Because he's done it. You see, that's the purpose of this. It's not that you are holding on. Life is not made up of an abundance of things you possess. It's made up of living with God and knowing that sometimes you have high and sometimes you have lows. But in all things, we glorify Christ because it is Christ that is guiding. It is Christ that is leading. It is Christ that is taking us on to the place that we need to be. In Him, that true life is available. That true life, it's not false because the things of this world are false and the ideas of the world are false that says that only the successful have the most. No, the most of the time that I've seen is that I love being by the bedside of one of those saints that's getting ready to pass on the glory. I love being by those because you can be by the ones of the younger man or the younger woman that has that has that life is is going to take their life from them, that that God is has their destined and time is over with for them, and they're mad at God. They're mad at everything and they're mad at the way things are working out in their life. And then you find that person that loves Jesus and they are excited because the next breath, the very next one might be with their king. I'm telling you, you, you understand because the Bible gives us the gift of of, of faith at that moment. I believe the Bible speaks of this in 1 Corinthians where when he gives you this faith, he gives you this moment of peace that you are facing the end of your life. And this is part of faith. It's part of many aspects of it. But one of it is when you face that life moment when the enemy comes in and tries to say that death is coming to get you, deny him, and it's his last gasp at you. And the Holy Spirit says, no, they follow me through this trial. And they follow me through that trial. And they follow me through this struggle and they follow me through that struggle. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send my gift of faith down to them right there and I'm going to deposit it into them so that when the enemy comes in and whispers, give in, they will respond with faith and send, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. It's truth, the true life of God. And this life is an abundance of, go of the goodness of God is what we are talking about, not an abundance of things we possess. Psalm 1611 says this, You will show me the path of life. 
and in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. I'll tell you where you need to be. You don't need to be down in any other place, in any other aspect. I love being outside. I love being at parks. I love being doing different things outdoors in nature. I love that atmosphere, but I'm telling you, there's one place that you can be that is greater than any place that you could ever imagine, and that is in the very presence of Jesus Christ. And in his presence is fullness of joy. Wherever you go, you can stand in the midst when life is coming at you and the waves are going and joy unspeakable and full of glory arises in your spirit because in him is that fullness of joy. Jeremiah 17, 8 says, For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding of fruit. Can I tell you that that's you? That's you if you follow Jesus. Plant yourself down by the river of the water of life, and set your feet down there, and say, I'm not leaving this place, because I need to put my roots in that water right there, and I I can't be going this way and I can't be going that way. I need to stay put where I am so that when the waves come in and when the trials come and when wickedness comes my way, I will not fail. I will not die. I will not wither and fail in drought because my roots are over in that river of the water of Jesus Christ and whatever I have need of, others may wither around me and others may, others may give in and give up but I know in whom I believe and I know in whom my hope is and I know in whom my life is and his name is Jesus Christ his name is Lord his name is King and he's there for you right now amen, amen. praise God the Bible tells us in John 10 10 the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundant he came that you might have life starting now living it now, abundantly in Christ. 1 John 5.11 tells us the, the, the revelation of that. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And I'll add this in there, given us eternal abundant life. That's the beauty. And this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have, the, have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I tell you, as we close out today, this eternal life that is there, John wrote it to us. He wants you to believe in the name. You see, we talk about this on a regular basis here, that there's only one name that you need to worry about. There's beautiful names of Hebrew. There's beautiful names of God. And I love studying them, and we will study them. But listen, if you, it's so simple. A child gets it. It's the name of Jesus. That old song that we used to sing when we were little kids, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so that is all you need to know i tell you wherever you go whatever you face wherever you are jesus loves me jesus loves me jesus loves me you may rebel you may fight against me you may say evil you may do all these things but jesus loves me jesus loves me and that's all the name i need that eternal life jesus loves me that you would believe in the name he wrote the bible that you would believe that jesus loves me i don't care if i've been on my back i don't care if it hurts i don't care of those things because i know jesus loves me i know that jesus cares for me i know that jesus will never leave me or ever forsake me thank you jesus
Will you stand with me across this room this morning? And let us, let us worship the Lord in this moment, this Palm Sunday, as we remember the blood, as we remember the things next, next Sunday and Easter. Let us not forget what this Sunday means. This means that we have freedom in Jesus, that we have hope in Christ, that we have freedom in the one that has given his blood, his life for us, that we can hold to this truth. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for giving us your beloved son. For Lord, the Bible tells us that you so love all that you gave your only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Lord, we cry out to you today. May the blood of Jesus come. May the blood of Jesus fill us. Hold to us, O oh God. May we hold to the truth that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil for you are with us. That even though we go through trials and even though we go through struggles and even though the enemy is there to fight, we know this simple truth. Jesus loves me. And that, it, that, that guarantee of eternal life, the abundance of life, as long as I don't go against the current, as long as I don't fight against you, that if I just go with you and allow you to take me where you want to take me, Lord, my life will be abundance with you. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. So, Lord, today we cry out to you.